Hello friends. How are you doing on this fine day? I hope you're doing well. This is video number six in our Praying Hebrews series and today we're taking a look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 through chapter 5 and verse 10. These verses, Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16, the very last paragraph of chapter 4, these verses introduce the subject of the high priesthood of Christ. And I would say, wouldn't you, that this is the main theme of Hebrews, Jesus, our high priest. And here, we learn that we have a high priest. Yes, Christians do have a high priest, and he is great. That's what the author tells us. Since we have a great high priest, let us do such and such. And his greatness is seen in the fact that he has passed through the heavens. That is, he has entered into heaven itself. You remember that others, like Aaron, had passed through a material veil into the Holy of Holies, but Jesus has gone directly into the presence of God. Another reason that he is great is that he is Jesus, the Son of God. This phrase in verse 14 joins together the human and the divine natures of our great high priest. Jesus was a human being, but he was also God's Son. He was also divine, and that makes him better than any priest of the Old Testament. And then there's another reason that he is great, and that is because he is a merciful and faithful high priest. And our author tells us that he is merciful because he is able to fully sympathize with our weaknesses, having been tested in every way that human beings are tested. And of course, the difference between him and us is that he was sinless. He never succumbed to any temptation to sin, and he always passed those faith tests with flying colors. Now, because we have a great high priest, there are four exhortations in chapter 4. Some we've already covered, and some are new to our text today. But four. By the way, that might make some pretty good preaching, wouldn't it? I suppose this is one reason why a lot of scholars think that Hebrews was a homily originally, that it was a sermon because there is theology and then there is exhortation and in the middle of that theology more exhortation chapter 4 we have four statements of exhortation number one let us fear that we might fail to reach God's promised rest that's chapter 4 and verse 1 number two let us make every effort to enter that rest chapter 4 and verse 11 the third exhortation is, let us hold fast to our confession. That's chapter 4 and verse 14. And then finally, the fourth exhortation, let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness. Chapter 4 and verse 16. With Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1, we begin a rich discussion of Christ's high priesthood. In the verses we are now considering, Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. The author wants to show that Christ is qualified to be a high priest. He begins his argument by listing some of the basic qualifications of the high priests under the law of Moses. First, a high priest must be selected from among men. That is, he must be a human being. And it's necessary that a human being be chosen to represent human beings in dealing with their sins against God. Second, a high priest must be able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, that is, with those who err and sin through ignorance. I think the author is probably talking about unwitting sin, as it's described in the Old Testament. A high priest must be able to deal gently with those who err and who sin through ignorance. He can do this because he himself is a human being who is subject to weakness. And then third, a high priest, every high priest, must be divinely appointed. We wouldn't want a high priest who had designated himself for this very responsible office. In verses 5 through 10, our author is showing us that Jesus is qualified to be that high priest. First, he did not exalt himself to this position, but he was appointed by God, who made him a priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
And our author does what he has done already so many times. He goes back to the Old Testament to justify what he is saying. He's using scripture to justify his argument. Then the author speaks of Jesus' human history in the days of his flesh, verse 7. And this verse must seem to refer to Jesus' agony in Gethsemane. Here he is showing us how intensely Jesus entered the human drama, how real and deep his experiences of suffering. If ever there was a time when Jesus experienced human weakness, it was in Gethsemane. In that hour of weakness and suffering, he turned everything over to his Father, and he submitted to the Father's will. And our author tells us that he learned obedience through what he suffered. Even though he obeyed, he still had to suffer. And this was the consequence of his becoming flesh. And it was an essential qualification of leadership. In other words, this suffering, this lesson in the necessity of obedience, perfectly qualified him to be our high priest. And the result, our author says, the result is that Jesus became the source of our salvation. According to verse 9, this salvation is eternal and it is available to all those who obey Jesus. We should note that carefully. The salvation Jesus offers is restricted to those who obey him. Christ, as son, had to obey the Father and all who expect salvation must first learn obedience as he did. Now, let's talk about application. I want to talk about prayer for just a few moments. Because we have a great high priest, a perfect go-between, a perfect representative before God, because we have a man in heaven, our author says we can draw near to God's throne of grace with boldness, and there we can receive timely help. Because it is a throne of grace and not a judgment seat, we can approach it with confidence. That is, we need have no fear. We need not have any inhibitions when we come before God in prayer, pleading for the mercy and grace that we need so desperately to help us in our time of need. And then we learn something of Jesus' prayer life, don't we, from his experience in Gethsemane. We learn from this text that he pled to his father with loud cries and tears. And by the way, that phrase is not mentioned in any of the Gospels, so this is new revelation for us. When Jesus was in Gethsemane and he prayed to God, he used loud cries and tears. This certainly shows the intensity of his prayer, doesn't it? There in Gethsemane, like all men, Jesus needed to pray. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, a human being, felt the need to pray to his Father. He needed to submit absolutely to God's will and feel firsthand the frustration of not giving in to his own human desires. And by the way, isn't this exactly what happens to us, what really happens to us when we pray as Jesus prayed? Oh, we ask God for certain things, yes. But in that process, in prayer, in the pouring out of our hearts to God, we learn submission to God's will. We learn not to give in to our own selfish and human desires. Prayer, then, is a time to wrestle with ourselves, to wrestle with our baser instincts, I suppose, and it's a time to wrestle with the will of God and finally to submit to it. You know, I, I know for a fact that prayer does more to change me than it does to change God. You know what I'm saying here? I know you've experienced the same thing. I go to God in prayer. I ask for certain things. I pour out my heart to him, sometimes with loud cries and tears. And that that process changes me. And I think that's what we learn about prayer from this passage. We can pour out our hearts to God boldly because we're approaching a throne of grace. 
And we can do so with loud cries and tears. That is, we can let God see how we really feel, how we really are. And we can use that moment, that time, to submit to the Father's will, just as Jesus did in Gethsemane. So, pray. Pray is the application from this text. Okay, enough for today. I hope to visit with you again on August the 3rd when we discuss spiritual childhood and the need to go on to maturity. God bless.